So you've probably heard about the SR-71 Blackbird, or the F-22 Raptor, or the B-2 Spirits, or maybe none of the above, but there were definitely a lot of big names in aviation, from fighter jets to bomber aircrafts, from strike to reconnaissance airplanes. But what exactly does all of that mean? I mean, what makes a fighter jet a fighter jet? And what makes it different from an attack aircraft? Well, in this video, I'm going to answer all of those questions by taking you through the different types of airplanes and what makes each of them so unique. And along the way, I'll tell you some of the cool stories behind how each of them were named as well. So let's get started. This video was brought to you by CuriosityStream. Get access to thousands of documentaries and access to my streaming service, Nebula, by clicking the link in the description. Around the 1700s, people discovered that since heated air is less dense than cooled air, if we could somehow manage to capture a mass of heated air and attach some carrying device for humans to it, it would allow us to float up into the sky. And hence, the very first hot air balloon was invented, becoming the first flying object. Although, it's technically not an aircraft. So what exactly is an aircraft? Well, according to the FAA, every fixed-wing aircraft satisfies three rules. It's an engine-powered, heavier-than-air machine that creates lift mainly through fixed wings. So the first actual aircraft in history, of course, was the Wright Flyer back in 1903. And very soon afterwards, with the start of World War I, people realized that, hey, if we strap some guns to these things, we can deal some major damage. Bullet. And just as quickly, these planes were used to defend against and attack other enemy aircrafts, essentially creating another battleground in the air, and hence the fighter aircraft was born. Fighter aircrafts, like its name implies, are made for air-to-air -air combat to intercept, attack, and destroy other aircrafts, or even missiles. It's no surprise that fighter jets especially are designed for maneuverability and speed through incredibly powerful engines and afterburners. And modern fighter jets are also usually equipped with very powerful radar to detect enemy planes before being detected themselves. Many also have the characteristic bubble canopy to maximize visibility. Some very well-known examples of fighter jets include the F-15 Eagle, the F-16 Viper, the F-22 Raptor, but actually not all airplanes with an F designation, but we'll get to that later. Fighter aircrafts can also be further classified into interceptors, heavy fighters, reconnaissance fighters, etc. So now you might be curious, what exactly is the difference between fighter and attack aircraft? Are the latter just more aggressive? Well, yes, but also attack aircrafts are made mainly for air-to-ground combat, as opposed to the air-to-air -air combat for fighters. Specifically, they're generally used for what is called close air supports, meaning they support troops on the ground closely. So for this reason, attack aircrafts are mainly designed with three factors in mind. First is flying low and slow, in other words, maximizing what is called the loiter time, which is the time an aircraft can spend over a relatively small area of land. This is something that most fighters were not very good at in the early years. Second was that it needed to sustain a lot of damage and still stay functional. A great example of this is the A-10 Warthog, an attack aircraft that was designed to fly with one engine, one tail, one elevator, and half of the wing torn off. So there is a good reason why the A-10 is one of the most iconic attack aircrafts in history. And lastly, many of these missions span over a long period of time. Hence, attack aircrafts generally have a longer range and larger fuel capacity. So designing an attack aircraft is a constant trade-off between the weight of fuel, ammunition, and armor. Another aircraft that was made similarly for air-to-ground combat are bomber aircrafts, although bombers are generally used for targets with a much larger area or for attacking several targets at once. Hence, most bomber airplanes are optimized to carry a much larger payload and often over a longer distance. Classic bomber aircrafts include the B-29 Super Fortress and the B-52 Straddle Fortress, both of which were especially engineered to carry atomic bombs across the Pacific. And there are two main classifications of bomber aircrafts strategic and tactical. Strategic bombers are focused on crippling strategic positions, usually enemy infrastructure or resources, and are typically large aircrafts traveling long distances. This is the category for the most common bombers we think of, like the B-2 Spirits and the various fortresses. On the other hand, tactical bombers are more focused on countering and supporting ground troops over shorter distances, so this is more similar to attack aircrafts. Examples of tactical bombers include the P-47 Thunderbolt and the MiG-27. 
And over the years, with the progression of radar and missiles, stealth has become an increasingly important factor for bombers as well, in order to, well, not get nuked first. Another aircraft that specializes in stealth is of course the reconnaissance plane, or the spy plane, that is typically designed to penetrate into enemy airspace without being detected in order to gather information, usually in the form of aerial photographs. Now of course, these reconnaissance planes prioritize stealth over anything else, and the main factor determining stealth is the shape of an aircraft, and hence we've seen some pretty unique looking planes in this category, like the F-117 Nighthawk or the SR-71 Blackbird. But sometimes, the need for stealth comes at a price. So for example, while the sharp angles of the F-117 Nighthawk do a great job at deflecting radar waves, it also creates a plane that didn't really want to stay in the air with limited lift and thrust. And for some other reconnaissance aircraft, if stealth is not enough, sometimes pure power will do the trick as well. For example, the U-2 Dragon Lady was a reconnaissance plane that was initially designed to fly higher than any radar and anti-aircraft missiles, and its successor, the SR-71 Blackbird, was another spy plane whose pilots said that they would simply speed up and change direction to outfly missiles. So for this reason, no SR-71s have ever been shot down. But as airplanes have become more sophisticated, they've also gotten a lot better at multitasking. So in a lot of modern airplanes, the line between fighter and attack airplanes or bomber and reconnaissance become muddled. Like the F-A-18 Hornet that, as its name implies, serves both as a fighter and attack aircraft, or the F-35 Lightning II that can perform fighter, attack, and reconnaissance missions. So let's talk about how these airplanes are named. In the US, most military aircrafts today follow what is called the 1962 US Tri-Service Aircraft Designation System. For fixed-wing aircrafts, it generally consists of a mission code, dash, and design number. The mission code is a letter that is assigned to each of the 18 mission types, like fighter, attack, bomber, and reconnaissance that we talked about. Other missions include cargo, utility, trainer, tanker, special research, and more. The aircraft's design number mainly follows chronological order, although some numbers are skipped when they are assigned to experimental aircrafts and never entered into production, or when an aircraft is transferred from another mission code but kept its design number. For example, like the X-35 to F-35. Sometimes, the mission code is preceded by a status code, and this is often the case for experimental or prototype aircrafts, like the YF-23 or the XB-70 Valkyrie. For non-fixed-wing aircrafts, the mission code is followed by a letter for the aircraft type. For example, the CH-146 Griffin and the CH-47 Chinook both have a cargo mission code, followed by a helicopter aircraft code. Of course, there are exceptions to these rules because the military just doesn't seem to be a big fan of following rules. Wait. Now, if you paid close attention, you might have noticed that most reconnaissance aircrafts weren't given their correct R designation. And that probably makes a lot of sense. After all, James Bond wasn't nicknamed Britain's Got a Spy Talent for a reason. So for this reason, some of the most iconic reconnaissance aircrafts, like the U-2 Dragon Lady and the A-12 Archangel, were actually given the more general utility and attack designations. The SR-71 was originally named RS-71 for the reconnaissance strike role it was originally designed for, but eventually the strike part was removed and the RS was changed to SR to stand for Strategic Reconnaissance. And there are also a lot of attack aircrafts that were incorrectly given fighter designations, like the F-117 Nighthawk or the F-111 Aardvark. This was supposedly because the Air Force wanted their top pilots to be flying these new attack airplanes, but these pilots were generally more attractive to planes with fighter designations. So for this reason, the RON designation was given to attract more talent. Common planes are also given a nickname. This is usually to reflect the power and performance of each type of plane. For example, a lot of fighter jets are named after powerful birds, like the F-15 Eagle, the F-16 Viper, and the F-22 Raptor. Dark and elusive creatures are usually reserved for reconnaissance planes like the SR-71 Blackbird and the F-117 Nighthawk. And bomber aircrafts are named after, I guess, a lot of fortresses? And different countries all have their unique naming conventions as well. For example, in Japan, all fighters are given names relating to weather and any on specific characters depending on their mission. In Britain, planes were originally named using the same initial as their manufacturer. So for example, the Supermarine Spitfire or the Hawker Hurricane. But very quickly, the names began to overlap. So eventually, planes were named after cities and the naval planes after coastal cities. And a lot of British trainer aircrafts are named after academic institutions, like the airspeed 
studied Oxford, the North American Harvard, and the Fairchild Cornell. Am I the only one who find this super interesting? This is definitely a Wikipedia rabbit hole I could spend hours in. Now after that long tangent, let's talk about aircrafts on the civilian side. So after wartime, countries realized that they had a huge surplus of airplanes that were just sitting around. So a lot of these airplanes, especially larger bombers, became converted into commercial airplanes. Initially, they were to deliver cargo and deliver mail, but eventually, humans became the cargo too. And today, most commercial airplanes, aside from cargo and private jets, are classified using mainly their range and capacity. For example, many medium haul aircrafts are usually also smaller, narrow body airliners. Now, these include the iconic Boeing 737s, the Airbus A320s, and the Embraer E jets. Now, medium haul is a bit of a loosely defined term, but generally, these aircrafts can travel up to the distance between London and New York, around 6,000 kilometers. On the other hand, long haul aircrafts are generally larger, wide body jets like the the Airbus A380 and the Boeing 787 Dreamliner that generally have around twice the range of medium smaller haul jets. Now, although every commercial passenger jet can also carry cargo, there are also some airplanes that were designed specifically as freighters initially. For example, both the Boeing 747 and the Antonov AN-225 were initially designed to carry space shuttles to their launch site before being converted into cargo aircrafts. Now, I won't be diving too deep into the history of these Boeing and Airbus planes and how they're named, so maybe we'll We'll save that for a future video. Now we've barely scratched the surface of the different types of airplanes out there and we've only covered fixed wings so far. There's still a world of helicopters and gliders and hot air balloons and blimps out there but in the interest of keeping this video under 10 hours I won't be going into those today. But a great place that you can learn about them and also fall even deeper down the rabbit hole is on Curiosity Stream and also today's sponsor. Curiosity Stream has thousands of documentary films and TV series series on pretty much any topic you can think of. One I just binged last night was all about the story of the DC-3, and it was basically what I aspire my Airplane Anatomy episodes to be. So in addition to giving my viewers 26% off, they've also teamed up with a streaming service I recently joined called Nebula to provide free access when you sign up for Curiosity Stream. Nebula is a platform made by educational creators where we can produce interesting and experimental content without the fear of the algorithm, so you'll be supporting indie creators like myself and also getting exclusive access to original content. And for less than $15 a year, you can have the best of both cinematic worlds. So if that sounds good to you, check out the link in the description below. And lastly, I wanted to say thank you guys so much for not only watching until this far into the video, but for your support over the last couple of months. I've been on YouTube now for just about three months and I've already hit over 1,000 subscribers. It's crazy to me thinking about 1,000 of you guys out there who are interested interested in hearing me talk about airplanes. Really without you guys, none of this would have ever been possible. And so I'm really excited to have made my very first sponsored video. And that is also because of all of your supports and your lovely comments. And really you guys are the motivation for me to keep making my videos. And so with that being said, if you enjoyed this video, please remember to give it a thumbs up and also remember to subscribe to my channel for new aviation content. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Thank you.